Thanks, everyone. And I'll ask you to excuse me because, of course, um, I managed to finish my leave up by getting the flu. So the last four days of my leave were taken up with trying to get over a flu. Um, I think that says something about the need for the leave in the first place. Um, just a bit of background before we get into the Aboriginal Affairs Strategy. Um, Ruth was very kind in her opening comments and uh, I've always found that working with the Northern Institute has been a pleasure not just for me but for my department, so I thank you, Ruth. Um, my department, uh, in effect, just to avoid some confusion, because even within government there's some confusion, uh, there are two distinct areas. One is the Department of Local Government and Community Services. The local government component is reasonably self-evident. Um, our role is a compliance and regulatory function, um, and that's the oversight of regional and urban councils in the Territory. The community services component in, used to be called regional services um, rather than go through all the functions that they perform, um, it's mostly remote and regional work. Uh, a perfect example is the 73 remote communities um, other than housing and Department of Infrastructure, uh, the responsibility for co coordination of delivery of services in remote communities falls within um, the Department of Community Services as part of uh, LGCS. Uh, the responsibility for 437 homelands and outstations um, falls within the responsibility of local government and community services. So 437 homelands and outstations, uh, so the delivery of services for the homelands and outstations falls within our area and the coordination of services for those. Can I deal with one of the early myths that we regularly hear about in the territory? Uh, neither this, this government nor the previous government, and I've worked for both, uh, are looking at closing any homelands and outstations. And I wanted to deal with that really quickly because after the uh, announcements that were made in WA some 12 months ago, then the rumours expanded that that's what was going to happen here. I haven't heard that from either the Chief Minister or any other minister, and it has not been the intent of this department. The second part um, is the Office of Aboriginal Affairs, and I'll work through that process with you because uh, it, it leads to the Aboriginal Affairs Strategy that I'm here to speak about today and some of the policies and programs that have fallen out of that piece of work. Um, I do encourage questions at the end of this. I've done this presentation a number of times. Uh, we've tended to concentrate more on Aboriginal peak organisations and uh, communities. The consultative process has mostly been with those organisations and communities, but also with the industry sector. And so we've done, I've done the presentation in every region on a number of occasions and a number of remote locations as well, but I'm interested in the feedback from this group. Um, so please don't hesitate. So, Department of Local Government and Community Services, my minister is Bess Price. And uh, Minister Price, most of you would have heard of or know of. Um, I have an enormous amount of respect for Minister Price. Uh, and uh, Minister Price has also led to the fact that our department has women's policy, men's policy, and we're in fact the first government in Australia to have a men's policy unit. No other government has had one. The purposes behind the men's policy unit I'm happy to discuss later on. And yes, it is the ambition of this chief executive to achieve a time when we need not to have two separate units that are known as women's policy and men's policy, but in fact, a perhaps a group that works on gender and non-gender specific policies. Uh, however, at the moment, there's not a doubt that we need to have 
two very specific units. The purpose of the men's policy unit is more to deal with the issues that are associated with the perhaps lack of education and lack of support that can be sometimes provided to Indigenous males, in particular in remote communities that find themselves in difficult circumstances. And that's in no way to excuse behaviour or actions that are taken by some of those males. But I put to you as an example that um, from a domestic violence point of view, it's something that my area, and we're just about to take over the Directorate of Domestic Violence. It's transferring over from the Attorney General's department to my department and we'll work closely with both uh, men's policy and women's policy. But one of the issues that we're confronted with, and you're probably aware of the statistics, so I won't bore you with them, but um, I think it is a blight on us all that we are 34 times the level of domestic violence against women in the Territory in comparison to anywhere else in Australia. And 34 times is just, I have difficulty getting my head around that. Um, there have been some very strong programs put in place. Minister Price, for those of you that don't know, and she has gone public on a number of occasions, uh, is a victim of domestic violence, and she wants me purposefully to continue to use the term as is, because she believes that it leaves a mark that lives with you for the rest of your life. Um, it's one of the reasons I find her to be an extraordinary human being. I'm not talking about the politics of it now, I'm talking about the person who has managed to lift herself out of that and put herself where she is at the moment, but has a very strong sense of what needs to be done. And part of that is the education of males, in particular in remote communities where the TOs are consistently telling me it is not a cultural matter. It is more behavioural rather than cultural. And one of the programs we're working on at the moment is we have a number of women shelters out there. We're now looking at uh, the identification of locations for men's shelters and the purpose behind that. And I'll just brief example is you may get a remote community of 200 people, perhaps less, considerably less in some instances. Uh, an issue of domestic violence takes place under normal circumstances. There may be charges, there may be an apprehended violence order taken out against the individual who is still in that community. Um, the individual may turn to different forms of substance abuse to deal with the issues or may not, but find themselves still caught in a community where their natural inclination is to go back to where they normally reside or where they normally stay, and there's no alternatives for them. Our experience is that what that does is it exacerbates the situation. Apart from the breaking of the OVO, it leads to additional violence taking place and in some instances far more severe than the initial instance. So we're looking at things like men's shelters and others and that's just an aside. The vision of the Office of Aboriginal Affairs, I was asked to start the Office of Aboriginal Affairs in May of 2015 by the Chief Minister. One of the unusual aspects for a, an agency such as mine is that we are not recognised as a central agency. So normally within government, and if you already know this, then I apologise, but I'll go through it again. You have what are known as central agencies. The two most easily recognised central agencies are the Department of Chief Minister and the Treasury. So they're the most well-recognised central agencies. Their functions are normally coordination or very specific around the creation of policy or coordination of policy across the whole of government. The majority of the remainder of agencies are what are known as operational or delivery agencies. And that's whether it's education or health or uh, ourselves or anyone else 
that's in effect what they are. So this is one of those unusual instances where under normal circumstances the Office of Aboriginal Affairs would sit within an agency similar to DCM or Department of Chief Minister. But in this instance it was very clearly identified by the Chief Minister that he saw the obvious linkages that existed within my department, the delivery of services that come out of my department, the closeness of my team to remote Indigenous issues and regional Indigenous issues. That doesn't mean that we don't look at urban issues as well. But he had an understanding that he wanted it removed from the normal process and to place it within a service delivery agency to perform a whole of government coordination. It has caused some confusion, even within government, but we're dealing with that. And the breaking of the paradigm is important. And I stay. <laughs> so that's the vision. And can I make the point? Um, you will hear me speak about economic development right through this exercise. You'll hear me use the term wealth creation through this exercise. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions about wealth creation and what that means, or I'm hoping there'll be some questions around it. Can I ask you to consider one component in this? The experience that I've had in using the term wealth creation on a regular basis when I've spoken to groups is um, the European concept of wealth, an accumulation of assets, which is what I'm consistently spoken to about. The wealth creation we're talking about within remote communities is about economic development, but wealth in a remote community is about, and should be in a European context, but in this context, is about culture, is about social context, but it's most importantly about providing an opportunity for individuals that live in remote communities to participate in the economic development of the territory and in particular within their own community. So if I could ask you to keep that in mind, that is conceptually the point that we started with. March 2015, I said May earlier, which is when the chief called me in, but March was when the chief had the idea. It reports directly to the chief minister as opposed to Minister Price, as I said, two separate departments. The major policies and programs, uh, and I'll work through each one of them. I, I speak too long on one of them, pull me up. The first one is the remote contracting policy, and some may be surprised that I've got it at the very top of the presentation, um, considering the angst that it caused recently in the press, and in particular in Alice Springs in Central Australia. Um, and I'm happy to discuss any of the issues that were raised by contractors in particular in that area. You may have seen one of the articles that actually said that uh, the remote contracting policy was a reintroduction of apartheid. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm glad that some of the looks that I just got seen because it was bloody confusing for me as well. But, uh, but I went and met with uh, the contractors in, in Alice Springs and had the conversation. There's, there was confusion in some of their minds between two policies. There's a policy um, that is driven out of the Department of Infrastructure, which is in effect a provisional sum policy where uh, there are a number of milestones established within any contract between a contractor and uh, Department of Infrastructure for the delivery of infrastructure, a 10% provisional sum, which is a milestone payment at uh, the end of that contract. In effect, it withholds 10% of payment, ensuring the contractors have met the commitment that they made at tender time to the number of Aboriginal employees that would participate in that specific piece of work. That appears to have caused a substantive amount of uh, consternation between contractors, 
sub master contractors, subcontractors, and Indigenous employees. The remote contracting policy is a very separate piece of work, and I'll go through the data associated with the intent, which is economic development and Aboriginal employment. The Community Champions Program is an unusual program. It is 13 chief executives, myself included. Uh, I, as the chief, reminds me consistently I'm the community champion for all 73 remote communities, but 13 chief executives have been specifically assigned communities, 21 in all. My specifically assigned communities, for example, are Uendamu and Lajamanu. Um, for the, has anyone been to Uendamu or Lajamanu? Okay, great. So you know their <laughs> sister communities um, and in effect uh, only separated by 600 kilometres, but fantastic communities, both of them. Um, as the community champion, I'll speak about my specific role with those communities is I take my Chief Executive of the Department of Local Government and OAA hat off and go to that community to meet with the TOs and the Aboriginal organisations within that community. And my initial role is very clear. It's to actually listen to what the community believe their needs are to support them, in particular from an economic development point of view. Now, initially there was thought that the majority of these communities have out the economic development components or the opportunities that existed. Our experience is quite the opposite. In effect, there's been a substantive amount of thinking. Um, but one of the points that they made in both my communities and a number of others that I've visited, um, they would argue that perhaps we haven't listened. But they have some very clear ideas about where they'd like to take things. And so my role as a community champion is to listen to that. I have a small pocket of money um, that I can, and, and it's low-hanging fruit, dollars, if we're honest. It, it's to identify some fairly quick win projects within the community and we're only we're talking quarter of a million dollars for each community and each community champion and it and it can be as simple as a new shelter over the basketball court it could be a stage um, uh, just a concrete platform stage any of a number of small minor projects that are delivered by the community within the community, supported by me as the chief, or oh, sorry, as the community champion. Um, and it's been quite remarkable, the uptake we've had in this, and, and they are, I reiterate, quick win projects. The second part of the community champion's role is to identify the existing organisations and with the support of the Department of Business, and uh, DOB have engaged a number of uh, uh, Indigenous business development officers that actually work in remote NT with the community champions. And their role is when the community champion has identified clearly that there's a pre-existent organisation within that community and within... Uendamu and Lajamanu, but more in Uendamu is Waidak, and, uh, and they're actually not a bad little group. Uh, but what it comes down to is what support are they going to need? And, and the first step is identifying capacity and capability. Our experience has been regularly that um, in the past, perhaps, we've gone into community and perhaps given everything to one of these small organisations um, and created an environment where, in effect, we're setting them up to fail uh, because they don't necessarily have the wherewithal or the capacity or capability. So using the Indigenous Business Development Officer and each community champion has a community liaison officer from my department that supports that specific community champion is uh, 
We identify what the needs of that organisation are by working with the organisation. So it isn't me going in there and saying, you need, it's we understand clearly. Perfect example. You and the Moo have got a very successful mechanical workshop in place. They have three apprentices in that mechanical workshop and in effect it's running and been running with minimal grant support but doing some really clever work and, and I'm quite amazed at the mechanical ability of some of the youngsters that work in that workshop. They suddenly also wanted to be a builder and, a, and, and do the engineering and construction side. They just don't have, other than this new CEO who has an engineering background, they just don't have the capacity and capability at this point to take on the building and construction side of things. So what we've worked together on is how we could grow the business with the mechanical workshop. So in effect, I have facilitated, and, and you know, it, it, it shouldn't be about I, but I'm purposefully concentrating on my communities and I'll speak about some of the others. I facilitated uh, with a local mining business who has a large, small fleet that in effect, they've been willing to, over a period of time, build up the number of their small fleet that rather than send them to far off locations as they have in the past, they're now going to the mechanical workshop for their servicing and for the works that can be conducted out of that mechanical workshop. And the difference it's made to the program is that they've engaged three more people. Two of them are, are, are additional apprentices. And the quantum of dollars that it'll bring into the community over the next 12 months is $1.7 million. Doesn't sound like an enormous amount of money, but the difference is that that 1.7 goes straight back into that community. The other component is we've just built a bakery in there and you may have seen our bakery program. And again, I was criticized when I announced the bakery program uh, and the criticism was that I was introducing unhealthy product into these communities. Um, yes, they do do pies, pasties and sausage rolls and they do do cream buns and they do do cakes of all sorts. But the alternative in the past was exactly the same, but it was frozen and took months to get there and wasn't providing five Indigenous jobs in the bakery within the community. So I would love to get to the point where we can be uh, even more cautionary in our approach to the product that's being sold. But the importance at this point was to create the five jobs and at the end of 12 months that so they're being support, supported by an external organisation, we're just about to go out to tender for another 21 bakeries to put out there. Uh, they're being supported by the external organisation for the first 12 months of the operation. At the end of 12 months, no cost to WIDAC or the whomever the local board wanted to go to, but the bakery becomes comes under the ownership of the local Indigenous organisation and will remain as theirs. So the nexus that we I've created there is we've got small fleet going backwards and forwards from the mining company. We've got a bakery that's producing baked goods. So I speak to the mining company and to WIDAC and say, where are you buying your baked goods from? And they've got a contract with uh, Spotless from memory or Sodexo, one of the two. Um, so they needed to be careful that they didn't breach, uh, breach that contract. But what they've agreed to do is to purchase baked items from the bakery and bring them back to the mining operation where they're sold to their operators there. And the vehicles that are being used to do it are the vehicles that are being transported backwards and forwards to be fixed by the mechanical workshop. Again, it's not earth shattering, but means an enormous amount of difference to that specific community. We're doing the same thing in larger Manu, but if I went on about that, that's all we'd end up speaking about. So that's a community champions program. 
is a monitoring and evaluation framework, and this is the gutsiest piece of work that comes out of the Office of Aboriginal Affairs, and I'll explain why in some detail. But effectively, every six months, the Office of Aboriginal Affairs compiles a list of all commitments made by all agencies within their strategies or policies, in other words, key performance indicators and measurable results, and they report to Cabinet. Uh, it made me the most unpopular chief executive in the Northern Territory Government. We didn't make up the KPIs. What we did as a department, and in effect there is a steering group, and it's the 13 chief executives from the comprise the Community Champions Program, plus uh, uh, a couple of other chief execs, uh, in particular Treasury. Uh, that's where the money is. You've got to keep them on side. So, uh, but in effect, what we did was we went through all strategies and policies from every department, whether it be housing um, or health or education, and identified commitments to Indigenous affairs. Um, what made it unpopular was that it suddenly found itself, rather than in a 70, 100, 300 page policy or, or a strategic document, it's on an A3 spreadsheet. And it's clearly highlighted to the agency and it's measured against the measurements that they put in place to begin with. That reports to Cabinet. The Chief Minister takes it to Cabinet. We've done our first report and uh, we're not that far off. And, and, and I think the brave thing is, from any government, is that uh, it will be made public once it's been before all of the Cabinet members. Um, and th there will be some failures within the reporting and successes as well. And it's why I call it a fairly brave exercise. Um, it, it, it goes well beyond the types of measurements, generic measurements that you see within Closing the Gap but it augments a program such as Closing the Gap and others, but it is NT specific. And it is meant to use, or to paraphrase a very old saying, and I'm probably one of the only people that's old enough to remember it, it's keeping the bastards honest, I guess. Um, so it, 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 people are now learning um, to accept the exercise, um, I have spent many hours speaking to my colleagues uh, and reminding them that the information wasn't made up by me or the people within my department. It existed within their own documentation. So uh, if there was an issue with it, then they needed to deal with that and their minister. But overall, it's all we could measure them by. Um, and. They're supplying the information for the measuring. And so what it's made people do is confront on a regular basis what they've committed to in broader context. Whole of government coordination. So that's, as I said, there is a standing committee. Normally, a standing committee of coordination is run out of DCM. In this instance, it's run out of my department. It comprises the 13 community champion chief executives, plus a couple more. Um, the purpose of that group is that it, it meets uh, once every two months. It's to ensure that the Aboriginal Affairs strategy, the programs and the policies are on track. And uh, they really keep me honest, I guess, to make sure that what we're presenting to the chief and to all other ministers uh, are continuously being reported on and understood by the Standing Committee. Not altered by the Standing Committee, but understood and signed off on. The Indigenous Business Development is what I spoke of 
They come out of the Department of Business and Michael Tennant from DAB has been one of my strongest supporters and he is the community champion for Nooka and Numbawa and uh, he's done some remarkable work in Nooka. I keep telling him he's got the advantage of being the Department of Business but uh, he has done some extraordinary work there. And the local Indigenous business, uh, one in particular in Nooka, has won uh, in partnership with other organisations uh, um, $57 million worth of work in the last six months. And the quantum of uh, dollars that come out of that, that goes straight back into the community, and a perfect example was one is a health clinic, and the health clinic is $6.3 million worth of uh, construction work and uh, ready for operation. Um, just over two million of that flows straight back into the community. The organisation is using some of that two million dollars to update the motel that they had built in the first place and so they're, um, they're cleaning up the existing rooms that are there but building four additional structures to support the motel. Um, and it's cyclical because, in fact, it's the majority of people that are staying in that accommodation are the workers that are coming in to do the work um, with the local community team as well. So Nooka is a great example. First Circles um, is one, and, and you may have seen it in the media last week, uh, whilst I was away, the First Circles team had their second meeting with Cabinet First Circles was one of the programs that I was told wouldn't succeed. Um, the First Circles was, in fact, an expression of interest in remote communities where we were looking for emerging Indigenous leaders. Um, I was told by many that we would struggle to find emerging Indigenous leaders in remote communities. Uh, we pressed ahead anyway and had just over 300 applicants. Our difficulty was actually culling it to 30 to be in the first group and that was 15 from north and 15 from south. They're not paid, they are mentored not coached and hopefully you'll get the difference in that uh, and they present to cabinet once every month and they present the issues as they see them as individuals that come out of community. Now, the majority of them have their own businesses. Two of them are standing for parliament in the next election. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, neither of them are running for the current government. However, uh, uh, I, I think it, it speaks well of this government that they accepted the fact the two of the first leader, the first circles group um, are actually running for the opposition in in, uh, in the upcoming election. And one of them is Sel Selena Yubo. I'm not trumpeting Selena in any way other than the fact that she is one of the most impressive young women that I've had the pleasure of meeting. And uh, I've done everything I could to get her to come and work for my agency, but uh, she she has an incredibly independent streak. And, uh, uh, and it's a pleasure knowing Selena and I wish her well in whatever she does because I have no doubt that she'll be successful. But she is just one example of uh, uh, the quality of individuals that have come out to us out of the First Circles group. Uh, we had two that uh, caused us some minor issues, um, and, uh, but both of them put up their hand and uh, resigned from the program as a result of uh, those issues and we had no problems replacing them and hopefully we'll continue the First Circles program because it has created an environment that uh, uh, Cabinet were blown away at their first presentation. It was the First Circles group that spoke really strongly about economic development in remote communities and the fact that remote communities have a very clear idea of their own economic future if they're given an opportunity to speak about it. Local authorities was a creation of 63. The chief keeps saying 73. It will end up being 73. The chief forgets that of the 73 communities, uh, there are 10 that do not actually currently come under what 
is known as the local government boundaries as they are. Um, and Nullumboy is a perfect example, and Jabiru is another one we're talking about mining uh, communities or other communities that were created or auspiced through a different model, and Mudujulu is another example. Um, eventually they will have local authorities. The creation of the 63 local authorities was because the message that was coming through was that the local voice, and I'm talking about within remote communities themselves, had somewhat been lost under the local government model. And so the creation of local authorities wasn't to usurp or undermine the local government model. It was to support it while still ensuring that you captured a local voice. Um, and we've had varying success. And part of the problem has been achieving a quorum at every meeting and, and uh, it's been going for 15 months. Um, we are consistently achieving a quorum in 57 of them. We'll get there with the rest, but uh, it, it is a continuous exercise uh, and should be, but the value is being recognised um, every time they get together. And it, it does come down to the willingness of the local government or the regional council to hear that voice and to act based on that. And if you put yourself in the position of a local government, you may have 20 of those local authorities all screaming at you at once about what your priorities should be. So it isn't a, an easy balancing act for them, but we're supporting them through that exercise and I think it will be successful in the end. Okay, so NT Remote Economic Development is about providing motivated, motivated Aboriginal people with a hand up and not a hand out. Um, again, um, I've been criticised for that comment. I don't resile from it. It's to create opportunities for Aboriginal people to achieve greater control over their resources, maximise those resources, build an environment that su supports sustainable business, increase local Aboriginal employment and grow financial wealth, community wealth. Some facts and figures. The majority of you would know this. Um, four regional centres, 96 major and minor communities. The reason I said 427 before is 500 is the figure that's consistently quoted. Um, a number of those 500 we've now managed to establish for our asset and access review are actually uninhabited homelands and outstations, not even transitionally inhabited homelands and outstations. So the real figure is, uh, is 427. Third largest land area, 90% of the coastline controlled by Aboriginal people, 50% of the Territory is Aboriginal freehold, for those of you that are unaware of that, under Eldra, geographically diverse, and our biggest issue, infrastructure and essential services. <coughs> that proves that I can put the same slide in twice just to test you all. Okay, um, what does economic development mean to Aboriginal people? Welfare dependency shift. I have a team, and it's a small economics team within my department that I'm driving absolutely insane, uh, but I think it would need to be insane to be in the economic development side of things here anyway. Uh, we're working closely with um, CAPA, the uh, Centre for Aboriginal Pol uh, Economic Policy, and, uh, and we're working closely with Access Economics. Um, the logic of working with Access Economics is they provide a lot of the data and the information to the Productivity Commission, so I'd rather work with them than try and work against them. What's the purpose of the exercise? Um, the simplicity, or I thought it was simple at the begin with, was to try to put a dollar figure against every job that we could create a sustainable job in the Territory, and the important word is sustainable, and that sustainable Aboriginal job in remote Territory is to put a dollar value in net saving to government, either Commonwealth 
or territory. At the moment, the figure that we've got for each job supported both by access and CAPA is $75,000 per annum per job. So the government, our government, has set a target of 3,800 jobs over three years. And that's sustainable jobs, so we're talking about jobs that go for the full three-year period and beyond. We're not talking about some of the programs that we've all dealt with that provide six weeks training or 12 weeks training or, uh, and not necessarily lead to longer term employment. I'm not critical of those programs, I'm just simply saying what we're concentrating on is jobs and sustainable jobs. But the figure we work out at the end of the three years, if we can achieve the 3,800, and that's both within the public service and private, is three quarters of a billion dollars. And I hesitate because I want it to sink in. Because uh, now, I had the most interesting conversation. Have any of you ever dealt with Treasury in Canberra? Keep it that way. <laughs> For your own sanity, keep it that way. What Treasury in Canberra call that three, three quarters of a billion dollars is, uh, and I'm, I'm still struggling, is uh, an accidental saving. Uh, that's fine. I'll accept the accident. Their argument is that those vacancies will be filled by others going into the welfare system. My argument is, but then you know that those people already exist. So surely they're all either already on the welfare system or we're still saving three quarters of a billion dollars because the funds that were being utilised for the jobs that we've created, you're now expending for them. They won't accept it as a justifiable. Look, it doesn't matter. The point is, Prime Minister and Cabinet Department and a number of others are accepting our figures. The most important point that I want to make out of all of this is that, and, and it isn't me, it's what this public service has done. I won't say the government, but the public service has achieved and the government. Um, this thinking these methodologies are now being copied by all the other states. I've presented in Victoria, I've presented in New South Wales, I've presented in South Australia. Next week I'm going to South Australia to sign an MOU with the Chief Minister and the Premier of South Australia who are adopting our economic development program, who are adopting our remote contracting policy model who are adopting a number of our programs when it comes to um, jury, <laughs> the enforcement programs, the recidivism programs that are now being um, broken. And hopefully you... Did any of you see the Four Corners program with uh, Mark, Dr Marsha Langton and uh, Josephine Cashman? We have engaged, my department engaged, uh, Professor Langton and Josephine Cashman to do that piece of work for us. Um, it, it's quite extraordinary, some of the work that's being developed. And, and, and I reiterate, it isn't just my department, it's across the board. It's education department, it's, I'm, I'm not entering the politics or the, the other components of it. What I'm simply saying is, the Commonwealth, and, and I guess it should be the greatest compliment that I went to a conference recently to do a presentation in Melbourne and the presenter before me was from Prime Minister and Cabinet and he did my presentation. So all I could do was stand up afterwards and, and congratulate him on, on how forward thinking they were and then ad lib for the next 30 minutes uh, supporting what they said. So I'll take, it, I'll take it as the greatest form of flattery is mimicry and copying. Um, so it's really starting to have an impact uh, and we need it. 
31% uh, of our population is Aboriginal. 3% of the remainder of the territory uh, of Australia is the Aboriginal component. Um, but when we look at uh, budgetary components and employment, if you consider the Commonwealth are now looking at 3% of total budget being their total budget being expended across agencies in Indigenous employment and to support Indigenous economic development, 3% of total Commonwealth budget in comparison to the figures we're looking at within our budget is where we should be aiming because we'll fall into that 3% factor at some point. So it's economic development and job creation, reporting to Cabinet and delivery of the Aboriginal Affairs Strategy, Aboriginal ownership of 85%, 90% of the coastline, potential of remote workforce, Aboriginal knowledge and the remote contracting policy. I do want to spend a bit of time on this. Um, so the purpose of the remote contracting policy is fairly straightforward. And I'll break it down into three major components, um, and it captures the entire policy. In, in effect, what we're looking at is creating an environment where, and I'm trying to find the exact figures, okay, where through the use of the remote contracting policy, we're aiming at 70% of all contracts, government contracts, under $500,000 can go from any government agency directly to any, and, and that's an important component. We're looking at minor repairs maintenance contracts on essential services, housing, transport assets, etc. And I'll speak about why that's the point in a moment. Can go directly to any local Aboriginal business or in effect any local non-Aboriginal business, but either one must exceed 30% Aboriginal employment. So why am I arguing that an Aboriginal business must have in excess of 30% Aboriginal employment? The answer is simple. For those of you that have spent time in the bush, you will know there, there are IBOs and IBEs out there that FIFO the majority of the people that they get in to do their work. So we've put in place exactly the same criteria for both. So you can be an Aboriginal owned business or a non-Aboriginal owned business, as long as you can clearly show over 30% Aboriginal employment, any agency can go directly to you for any contract under $500,000 and award you that contract. And if there's a number of you in a local area, then they can do a select tender process through that and award a series of contracts across those. Our baseline was 35%. We're aiming at achieving 70%. We're two thirds of the way there. That's contracts under $500,000. Open tender. What we've effectively done, and, and can I make the point that local government comes into this as well, because quite regularly, re regional councils are regularly forgotten and uh, in a lot of instances, regional councils have in fact virtually an all Aboriginal council or board and exceed 30% local Aboriginal employment. So they come into that as well. This is an important one. Baseline, zero. And that's where saying that over a 12 month period or by the end of 2017, we're aiming to achieve a minimum of five contracts of over $5 million a year that can go to any, any organisation that joins vent ventures with either ca of categories one or two. Does that make sense? So you can be a totally non-Aboriginal business 
with no Aboriginal employees, but if they joint venture with either category one or two that has the 30% or above, and we want to bring that up to 50, to tender for contracts over $5 million, and we're aiming at five a year. We achieved our target for this year in the first six months. And interestingly enough, the two major organisations that went and negotiated those contracts with Indigenous organisations are from Alice Springs. And they were the ones sitting there telling me that it was apartheid. So that's what we're trying to achieve by the end of 2017. Those five contracts will make a huge difference. One of them was a $40 million roads contract. I'll end on this because I've been told five minutes and that there is a, an enormous amount more that I'd love to tell you. But one, one of the most interesting things, and the reason we've targeted the 500,000 per annum plus is what we're really looking at is maintenance contracts. One of the issues that regularly comes about, and we've seen it consistently, we saw it in CHIP and we saw it in a number of other programs. CHIP was the Strategic Indigenous Housing Infrastructure Program, later called NPARI. Um, and they achieved some excellent Aboriginal employment figures, depending on the location, but did achieve some excellent figures. And it was a good program. The problem with it was, and I'll use um, Gumbelunt, no, sorry. Um, where are we building the slow and fast program at the moment? Putting you on the spot, see? Yeah. <laughs> Look, Gallowinku, that's it, thank you. Um, when we went to Gallowinku to start speaking to them after the crises of the two, um, Cyclones, Lamb and Nathan, uh, where we lost 84 houses. Um, and we've done the rebuild program in conjunction with the local DILAC group, which has been a wonderful exercise. 13 clans meeting with us on a regular basis and agreeing with a model for a way forward. The first thing that community said to us when we went in to give them options were, or was, we have 23 young men and women that were trained through the CHIP program. So CHIP achieved what it needed to achieve. And they worked consistently for the two, two and a half years that CHIP houses were being delivered there. But for the three years since that delivery, they hadn't had a day's work. And what the elders were telling us was that was in fact far more debilitating for those individuals than had they not worked at all. So the emphasis on every piece of policy or program you see is about sustainable employment. And the real sustainable employment is the five-year contracts. It's what we call period contracts. So whether it's housing maintenance or whether it's road maintenance or whether it's essential services, it's the maintenance programs. It's not the initial major project that makes the difference. You want them to be a part of the exercise, hence the joint ventures. So you have trainees coming into that and you have local Aboriginals being employed. But if you've got an Indigenous organisation joint venturing with a non-Indigenous organisation, and at the end of the ma major project, you create an environment where the five-year period maintenance contract can be awarded to the Indigenous, local Indigenous or non-Indigenous organisation with the 30% Indigenous employment, it's a guaranteed seven or eight year period of work. And I'll end with this, and, and hopefully you'll pick up that there's a small amount of passion in my thinking in relation to this. I'll end with this. The one thing that my, that one challenge that I've given my economics team, and they're all accountants and economists, so um, I keep accusing them of having no empathy whatsoever. Um, but, you know, they're 
it's not true, guys. It's, it's true that I accuse them. It's not true that they don't have any. But I've asked them to, to try and tell me this. If they can find a way to measure the impact on a child watching either the, of their parents going to work consistently every day and the impact it has on their willingness to go to school, and I'm seeing it because of the aspirational quality of what they can see around them. If they can put a measurement and a dollar figure on that for me, then we'll blow everyone away. That's what the Aboriginal Affairs Strategy is all about. Thanks for your time.